Hello there, my name is Martin Henley. This is the Effective Marketing YouTube channel. And if you've spent a second here, you will know that I'm on a mission to give you everything you could possibly need to be successful in your business. Now, the only way I know for you to be successful in your business is to be more effective with your sales and marketing. So I'm here giving you everything I know about sales and marketing. I'm pulling in anyone I can find with experience in sales and marketing to extract what they have that will be useful for you to be more successful in your business. We do the news, we react to the best and the very worst of marketing content on the internet. But today is a talk marketing with a guest. Now, today's guest has been running his business, the Institute of WOW, for more than 22 years. In that time, he has been the secret weapon for brands including News Limited, McDonald's, 7-Eleven, the NRL, Majura Tea, KFC, and BP, to name some of them. He is the author of the WOW Manifesto Giant book. He is known as Australia's leading business marketing expert and the Seinfeld guy. In his professional headline, he claims to teach how to double your client base in just six weeks. What you need to know about this man is that he absolutely loves a dad joke. Uh, today's guest is John Dwyer, also known to his friends as JD. Good afternoon, John. G'day, mate. I'm glad you brought up that dad joke thing. We've started on a real low point, haven't we? We started on a real low point, yeah. But, I mean, the pressure's on you now. You've got to come up with a dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did one of these, it would have been about a month ago. And uh, at the end of it, he begged me for a dad joke because I, I've got six millennial kids. So, of course, they all hate my jokes. And I said, <laughs> what are they going to call Bob the Builder when he retires? And, of course, the answer is what? And I said, Bob. <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, very good. Good. So if you've got six kids, then, yeah, you must be well versed in the dad joke. There's some stuff going on here. I don't know if we're going to get into this in the conversation or we should cover it now. The Seinfeld guy is kind of interesting. Australia's leading business marketing expert is kind of interesting. How do you get to have monikers like that, JD? You just make shit up. Basically, I made up those headlines myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, super cool. You've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to understand, Martin, I've come from the seminar background in the last 10 years, so therefore I can make shit up better than anyone. So, uh, yeah, no, look, uh, as you well know, when you write your copy for your web page or for you know, your books or whatever it might be, you have to do it in third person. Uh, so I just reckon I'm pretty good. So I thought, oh, let me see what sort of, uh, yeah, what sort of, you know, big headline can I do? Uh, I have to say, though, despite the fact that when you are in the seminar game, uh, there's a lot of scepticism for very good reason, by the way, because I've been backstage with a lot of the speakers. Um, but, uh, you know, you, yeah, you, you have to fight scepticism because most people who are watching seminar speakers um, are sceptical. And the best way for me to prove the value of them sitting in the room with me is to show them some case studies. And I reckon you can predict the future a lot better if you look at the history. And, you know, a lot of these seminar speakers, I'm sure you know this, a lot of them don't have a history. They're 23 years of age and they're telling you how to run your business. Yeah. So this seminar speaking thing, is this something that's particular or more pronounced in Australia? Because whenever I've kind of experienced it, it's been around kind of Australians, I think. Yeah, look, it's it's um it's a brilliant model. Um, I never discovered it until later in life, you know. So therefore, we've only been. I mean, obviously, the last two years it's all been Zoom webinars. But I mean, uh, up until then, uh, we would uh, hold a seminar at six o'clock at night, and it would go for two and a half hours. And I would showcase all of the case studies that I'm boasting about and the difference that we would make to businesses with incentive-based marketing. And then at the end of it, you'd make an offer, and that offer would be join my program for X dollars a month. And uh, it was very, very clever. Well, Anthony Robbins came up with it, you know, 40 years ago. It's a very, very clever model because it's called sell once to many. It's basically having 50 or 60 or 100 people in the room. <laughs> Anthony Robbins is 10,000 people in a room and you're selling once to all of those people. So pretty much for 99% of our clients these days, um, they might not be well versed at speaking. So they, they don't know how to put on a Johnny Carson show. But I say to them, hold a webinar because if you hold regular webinars, I mean, Pretty similar to what you're doing here, Martin. I mean, I, I don't know how many people are going to watch this, but if you and I were flogging something, this is the way to do it. You're selling once to many instead of one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, and I mean, this is the beauty of this, is that this will just sit here for the next thousand years. I know you've been in marketing for the last thousand years, and this will just be here for exactly. the next thousand years. Yeah. Whenever yeah. people find it, they will learn something about incentive-based marketing. 
Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? But I think there is a... I, I don't know if you will know or otherwise. I think Australian marketers are much more invested in selling themselves than they are in the UK, for example. So in the UK, and I'm sure you have the same model there, but it's much more the agency model where you are an agency. And Lord knows, there's a real trend. Like two or three people that I've interviewed already are running agency marketing type association type businesses where they have yeah. like lots of digital marketing agencies or marketing agencies who use them to support them to do their marketing. You know, it's kind of weird. It's kind mm -hmm. of got a little bit meta, but they're not particularly proactive. So that's what I think I'm saying is that the Australians seem to me to be much more proactive. And I don't know, it makes much more sense to me. It's like if you're a marketing agency, you should be eating your own dog food. You should be marketing yeah. yourself. You should be in the market, yeah. market picking up new businesses. Well, the crazy part about it, uh, Martin, I, I've dealt with a lot of agencies over time and uh, I've sort of been the enemy of an advertising agency because we're more direct response. And uh, as you know, well, not more direct, we are direct response. And uh, as you would know, advertising agencies try and get clients to get hooked onto what they call brand marketing yep. so that they can, sponsor, they can sponsor Manchester United for you know a million dollars a year and they can put ads on the side of buses and the backs of taxis and all those wonderful brand building things. If you're dealing with businesses like I am that are doing normally less than five million, uh, they are more interested in putting food on the table next week than building their brand over the next ten years. Um, and I'm not saying for a moment that brand is not important; it's absolutely vital. Um, but if you don't have McDonald's budget or Kellogg's budget or Toyota's budget, and you've got a business that's doing half a million or a million or two or three million, then of course you don't have enough money to go down the brand building path. So we tend to specialize in that size business and what they want is direct response so that the ad on Facebook appears today and they know whether it worked tomorrow. A hundred percent. And this goes to your claim about doubling your client base in just six, six weeks. So this is how you do it by being very direct, by being about getting winning customers, winning sales, putting money in the tail. And mate, because I heard uh, you had that in the uh, in the intro, I um, I'm looking for my book here. I had a uh, I had a I've got a book which is oh here it is here yeah, uh, and it's called the uh, the Avalanche Leads Formula. Okay, so it's uh, what I find with people. I would always say to people, do you are you interested in me helping you convert? or interested in me giving you a bucket load of leads. And if they say I'm interested in conversion, I say, look, I'm probably not the guy because if you can't convert, then that's something which I can't do much about, okay? Uh, but what I can do is give you a bucket load of leads. And, um, you know, we've had some instances. There was a magazine here in Australia called the New Idea Magazine, which is a women's magazine. Uh, I won't bore you with the details, but we, we held a promotion for them. They got 812,000 leads in one week. This is little Australia, right? We're 25 million population compared to the UK being 70 or 80 million. And they got 812,000 leads in one, one, one week. Um, and the way that we do that, of course, is you know the IP that we have behind a lot of these things. Uh, so we're a leads specialist. Uh, the business themselves should know how to close. They don't know, John. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I take your point. Uh, but the thing is, it's very hard for an outsider, be it you or me, to know the product well enough to know the hot buttons to close. I mean, I'm not saying that if they become a long-term client, then that's different. You know, if they're with you for six months or a year or two, we tend to have people who come on and they want a roadmap in two months. And so what we've done, we've cut all our consultancies now to two months. And uh, the reason we do that is because we found that if we provided them with ongoing consultancy, and we were whacking their credit card for three or four grand a month, by about the fourth or fifth month of the 12 month arrangement, they bailed anyway, not all of them, but some of them bailed anyway, because they said, oh, my name's John DeWire, but I get JD. So if I refer to myself as JD, that's what I mean. They say, oh, JD, it's not your fault. The marketing plan is brilliant, but we're just a small business doing $800,000. We can't get the time to do this. So you've, you've you know, had smoke coming in our credit card for the first three or four months. And you know, we, we just, we, we're not implementing anything. So uh, this idiot who you're talking to eventually woke up and thought, hang on, these small businesses, they just want a quick fix. They want a bit like, you know, when you go to the dentist and you've got a sore tooth, you just want him to fix it straight away. So that's what we've done. We've cut our consultancies down now to two months. And we say to people, look, come on board for two months. We'll provide you with a marketing overhaul. We'll show you what your website should look like. We'll tell you what to do on Facebook and you know LinkedIn and all the stuff that goes with it. 
And then after two months, we jump on our horse and ride off. But they've got a marketing roadmap that they can then implement themselves thereafter. Right. I'm with you. And the thing is, I suppose, is that if you have the right volume of leads and the right quality of leads, they start to close themselves. You know, if if you are generating. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it blows my mind. The, the thing is, where am I? I? You know where I am. I've kind of given up on having customers a little bit like you clients. I don't want to be. I do a little bit, but where there's the resource because like you say they don't have the marketing budgets of the brands like mcdonald's but they also don't have the resource they don't have people sitting yep. around who can make things happen and they don't have the brand of those people you know so it's an entirely different gig um so what did i want to say i feel like marketers there is a brand of marketer who's very precious about what marketing is and actually maybe that isn't appropriate anymore um, you know, maybe somebody like you can just give them all the leads they could possibly need and, and that will work. And they don't need necessarily the strategy and they don't need to understand what the things are. You know, um, is that where we've got to, do you think? Well, Martin, don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, we can help them with conversions. There's no question about that. But our main claim to fame would be if they've got a conversion rate of two out of ten, um, the more leads I can give them, that of course, the more money they're going to make, even if they don't improve the conversion rate. Yeah. So, um, and if you said to me, what, what's easiest for us with our skills to do, it's much, much easier to get leads for them than to train them to convert. Because at the end of the day, we're not at the coal face. I yeah. don't have to be at the coal face to put a Facebook campaign on and give them a shitload of leads. I mean, they can do that from afar, yeah. but I'm not at the coal face. And, and really, it, it, to, they couldn't pay me enough money to go in and do the training of their sales staff. I mean, I'd just kill myself. I'd drive to the hardware store and buy some rope. <laughs> okay. I don't, well, don't do that then. Please don't do that, JB. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Um, the thing is, I think we're in agreement. I think that I, I, I think the two of us, have spent a lot of time trying to convince business owners to do the right thing. And I think there's a number of reasons why they don't do the right thing. Like very occasionally, they won't have the resource to actually make it happen. Quite often, I find they're quite egotistical and they've got a sense that the marketing is the one thing they, they really have absolute control of and they absolutely want it to happen their way. So I think there's a number yeah. of reasons. My frustration is where you go and see Lord knows I haven't been to see a new client in the last 10 years, but you go and you blow their minds with the opportunity and they want to do business with you and you start invoicing them and immediately you go back. They're now the world's expert on whatever it is that you've done and they don't want it to happen any other way than they want it to happen. That was my big frustration. So, uh, but I think we've, each of us have resolved this in other ways. I'm now giving the world everything I possibly can for free through this, through this channel and I'm hoping that YouTube will make it worth my while eventually. But you're doing an entirely different thing, which is you're, it's literally you're doing it for them. You're not laying any expectation at their door, which yeah. kind of brings us to where we need to be going, which is to your specialist subject. So as you know, there are only five questions. Your specialist subject is um, incentive-based marketing. So the questions are, how are you qualified to talk to us about incentive-based marketing? Um, who do you work with and how do you add value in their lives with incentive-based marketing? What is your recommendation for people who want to get better at uh, incentive-based marketing? So I've got to get the keywords in here. This is where we're going. Um, what should people read? And who can you throw under the bus who might endure to have a conversation like this with me so you might want um, to start um, you, you, you've uh, you've mistaken me uh, for someone who's not old I, i'm an old fart these days i can only remember the first question so i'll, I'll do that one first um, okay good yeah, i will remind you of the questions don't worry mate we're good <laughs> yeah, okay um i wasn't fast enough to write them down uh mate look all jokes aside the incentive based marketing thing uh for a small business can be rocket fuel if they if they get it right um and it's basically we call it a happy meal toy so, you know, I've got six adult children now, but we had six under 12 many years ago. And uh, I think my wife spent six gazillion dollars at McDonald's on Happy Meals and she couldn't tell you what they cost. And the reason that she couldn't tell you what they cost is because McDonald's took her eyes off the price. And uh, Kellogg's have been doing that for about the same five decades. Okay, there's a toy in the bottom of the cornflakes pack. 
Uh, Amazon do it with their Prime membership. They give you free um, shipping and they give you free movies and free music and all that sort of stuff. So it's all about providing the consumer with an incentive so that they're not focusing on price. Because if they're focusing on price, then the guy down the road is going to beat you in five seconds. But if you're giving them a dining voucher or a movie voucher or some sort of incentive, then the guy down the road is likely to be lazy and he won't match that. Okay, cool. So that's what incentive-based marketing is. Um, how, how have you been involved in incentive? How long have you been involved in incentive-based marketing? Oh, mate, forever, like decades. And, and, you know, I swapped across to the small business sector about 10 years ago only because, you know, I said to my wife, look, we're not getting any younger. I, I was uh, consulting to your McDonald's and your KFCs and uh, your 7-Elevens and News Limited. I would do all the big scratch games. I mean, you guys in London would be very familiar with newspaper scratch games. Um, I did pretty much all of the production and design of Rupert Murdoch's scratch games throughout all of his newspapers, uh, the McDonald's and KFC. You know, the KFC mug, Looney Tune mugs and Daffy Duck that you'd get when you bought a bucket of chicken, all that sort of incentive-based stuff. And um, it was good, but, you know, you had to sort of, you know, go from boardroom to boardroom. And uh, so I said to my wife, look, I think there's a lot more money to be made if we swap to the small business sector um, and we provide this IP to small businesses. And I'll never forget, I walked out of my first seminar here in Australia and we had, oh, I don't know, 100 people in the room, 100 business owners. And I asked the people in the front row, what did they do for a living? And the first one was a psychic. The second one made garden homes. And the, th the third one was a, um, she was a, 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 predict a predictor of the future. And I remember at morning tea, I said to my wife. A fortune teller. Wait, 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 wait. So you had, who teller. did you have? It was a, a, a lady who made garden gnomes, uh, another lady, all three ladies actually, but a lady who made garden gnomes, a lady who was a psychic, and the other one was a gypsy, like fortune tellers, very similar. Um, you know how to pull a crown, said, eh? Oh, yeah, I said to my wife, what I, I said to my wife, look, what the hell have we done? I've gone from the corporate world where, you know, uh, you, you know people were business people, and we've come into the seminar world. I, I, just kill me, you know. That's when I said to her, I'm driving to the hardware store to buy some rope. Um, and I realised that, you know, if you talk to a small business owner in the uh, corporate language, for example, KPI, they thought I was talking about a new chicken chain. So uh, I had to understand that, you know, small businesses are very, very good technicians. They're great at what they do. So they're a good pool cleaner or they're a great carpet cleaner or they're a great landscaper or butcher or baker. But they don't have a lot of time and a lot of skills in the area of marketing. And uh, the, the silly thing that I did was went down the path of providing consultancy. And as I said right at the very beginning, I've learned in this last few years, really, they don't want consultancy. They just want done-for-you package promotions. And that's what we do. Okay. So that's what brought you to the incentive-based marketing. So how does So we get a sense of how this works for big businesses. How does it work for small? What kind of businesses does it work for? That's what I'm interested to know. Well, look, the, the one that we do these days, and it's the number one incentive in the world, the statistics show that, um, there's two incentives that uh, are probably the best in the world. Number one is holidays. You give someone a free holiday when they buy your refrigerator or your air conditioning system or you clean the pool or whatever it might be. So Holidays, particularly after the pandemic, of course, are red hot. It's the hottest Happy Meal toy you could possibly think of. And the other one, uh, which we're just launching in a couple of weeks' time, is uh, fuel discounts. And so, therefore, we're launching a fuel discount. And in Australia, the biggest supermarkets, which are Woolworths and Coles, if you spend $30 with them, you get a $0.04 cents a litre um, fuel discount. We're going to be able to allow the local butcher baker down the road or cafe to give up to a dollar per litre fuel discount. And it will only ever cost him 10% of his uh, revenue. So he's got a choice. You either discount my butcher shop uh, goods by 10% or I give them uh, petrol discounts up to a dollar. Which one do you think would probably work? Of course, the petrol discounts. So uh, all of that's done for them. Basically, they just pay us a fee. We provide them with the entire package and it just runs by itself. Wow. Okay, so there's a few things I'm interested in. This idea of keeping their eyes off the price, I've only heard this today because I, I experienced your webinar. Um, mm -hmm. The problem is, exactly like you're saying, is if you are discounting as opposed to incentivizing, then what mm -hmm. you're doing is causing them to focus on the price. 
like if you're saying every day this is cheaper this is less this is you know then then they become because i don't think people are particularly price sensitive myself when they buy stuff um unless you make the price th the main feature of your product um so it's kind of an interesting thing um so why or how Maybe I've just answered the question, which would have been a bit stupid. How are we going to have a conversation like this? <laughs> um, so, so that's what I'm interested to. Okay. So what goes on here is something that I really talk a lot about and believe a lot in is trying to get people to understand in a much more kind of dollars and cents way the value of marketing. So I talk to them about cost of customer acquisition. So, and I tell them if you are in the business of proactively marketing, you're effectively buying customers. Every customer you win will cost you some time, some energy, some money. So it seems to me that this incentive marketing, there would need to be some kind of understanding of that already. Does that make sense? It so, does. And, but Matt, Matt, I'm biased because obviously we make our money out of incentives these days or incentive promotions. <clears throat> but for a small business, um, doing a couple of million or less, it's the only answer. There is no other answer. I mean, I've been around since 1842. I've tried everything. Okay. And uh, there is no other answer for them in a global community. I mean, let's face it. it, it I, I used to think that going overseas was great because I could see all of these um, retailers and businesses that I never ever saw in Australia. So you would go to I, I, just before the pandemic, I spoke at a conference in Dubai and um, every retailer in the shopping centre there was a national retailer, exactly the same as in Australia, whether it would be a jewellery brand or whether it was a furniture store. So the global community means all these big guys have basically taken over. And if you're a small guy, let's just say, take a hardware store. I, I use this as an example quite often because people get it. But in Australia, we have a big hardware chain called Bunnings. They're like a Walmart, okay, but hardware. And they're about the size of a football field, massive, right? Uh, and they guarantee that they'll beat any other price by 10%. So if there's a hardware store sitting next to them, the typical old, you know, Mr. Smith hardware store, if he tries to beat this 40-ton gorilla on price, he's never going to win. They're on TV every night advertising they'll beat any other price by 10%. So why would he go down that path? But guess what? They do. However, if he said, buy my wheelbarrow and I'll give you a free pitchfork or I'll give you a free shovel, they couldn't match him. They'd have six months worth of committee meetings to find out how they could get approval to give away a free shovel. But if he actually tried to discount that wheelbarrow, bang, they can beat him within five minutes. Right. And so you've gone straight to what I think is a really important place that we've got to in the world, which is is literally small businesses versus the corporations. Yes. Um, you know, in the UK... In the last 20 years, Tesco's have just come through and wiped everybody out. You know, a mate of mine was running a butcher's and a greengrocer's. He did that for, he might have done that for 20 years. Um, Tesco opened a, um, a Tesco local 30 meters from his store. His store was immediately not viable, you know. So, yeah. so yeah. this is the point, I suppose. But then... The best example... <laughs> the best example I could give you, Martin, is a uh, building society that I uh, had a, a, as a client for a dozen years, and uh, they're called the Greater Building Society. And when I got involved, I did a time and motion on their business for the first month, as every consultant does. And of course, as every consultant does, I just bagged out the advertising agency that was there before me, because <laughs> that's <laughs> what you do. And uh, uh, but the advertising agency had stupid you know, billboards on the freeways where sooner or later it, it's the greater. It was called the Greater Building Society and they just, you know, pissed money up against the wall by having these branding. Oh, not even branding, it's just ridiculous. Sooner or later it's the greater. And I said to the chief of the building society, uh, to me, sooner or later it's the greater is like a derogatory statement. Like, oh, well, sooner or later I guess we'll go to the greater, you know. And uh, they had ads on the back of bloody taxis and the side of buses, and they sponsored the local football team. You know, they paid a quarter of a million dollars to have their logo on the shorts of the Newcastle Rugby League team. And, I, and, and of course, they were conned into doing that because the agency was told by the football club that on the TV of a weekend, they got, you know, 34,000 impressions. In other words, when people were watching it, they saw their shorts, 34,000. I said, how does that relate back to getting a home loan, for God's sake? I mean, this is just rubbish. So I said to them, listen, how about you do this? Why don't we get rid of um, 
your interest rates forever. You'll never advertise another home loan interest rate, which is a bold statement from this idiot. And uh, they said, okay, smart Alec, um, what's this all about? Now, I had been doing some infomercials on TV. I've done a thousand of them for the Ab Swings and the George Foreman barbecues and all that sort of stuff. And I was doing some infomercials at the time for a discount travel company. So I introduced them to the Greater Building Society. And I said to the Greater, you don't have any acquisition scheme. And they said, yes, we do. We have a 1% honeymoon rate. I said, every bank's got a 1% honeymoon rate. So if it's 4% interest, they give it to 3% interest rate for the first year, and then it bumps up to 4%. I said, give that to the travel company, and they'll give you a fantastic deal on holidays. And so they said, okay, well, we'll give you a rope. You can either hang yourself or be a hero. Uh, so we came on TV and social media, and we said, swap your home loan from the big nasty banks across to this friendly building society, and we'll give you a free holiday. Never mentioned interest rates. Not once in 11 years did we mention interest rates. You imagine running your business for 11 years, not advertising a price. They doubled their home loans in the first three months. We're talking billions, not millions, okay? Doubled in the first three months. They quadrupled their, their loans in the first 18 months. And then we ran that for about five years. It was just going unbelievably well. And then I got Seinfeld to do their advertising. So I got Jerry involved. And once you get Jerry Seinfeld involved in something, you can imagine, you know, it's a wow factor on top of a wow factor. So we had Jerry Seinfeld saying, swap your home loan, get a free holiday. Now that ran for 11 years. And they guess what? They were the highest home loan interest rate in the world, in the world. So that's how, I mean, we're talking people borrowing half a million or a million dollars and they took their eyes off the price. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So, literally, wow. The Institute of Wow, has it always been about this incentive based marketing? Was that, is this the yeah. wow factor in this? Okay. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. So, look, if Rupert Murdoch came to me, uh, not him personally, but yeah, his company would come to me and they'd say, listen, uh, we would like to uh, stimulate newspaper sales uh, in the month of August, let's say. I would come up with a concept that they could do. Not always bingo. A lot of it was scratch bingo. But, um, you know, if, in the, if there's a Jurassic Park movie around at the time, we would do what would be called a grey market. In other words, we don't take the licence out from DreamWorks, but we would have a dinosaur book and stickers collection so that when you bought the paper on the Sunday, then you got an album with your first two stickers and then you had to buy the daily paper every day for the next two or three weeks to get the rest of the stickers. So therefore, again, that's what, what we call a continuity direct response promotion. So therefore, their paper sales would go through the roof. And guess why they wanted to do it? It's because September was when they renegotiated with the advertising agencies their advertising rate. So they wanted to lift the paper's circulation, of course, in August. Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Is there, I don't want to distract from this, so you let me know if I'm going in a stupid direction because I do sometimes. That's true. But if it sounds like you're not only taking the eyes off the prize, the price, you're taking their eyes off the product because an interest rate in a building society situation effectively is the product. Is it? Is it not? You know, well, no, so the product is money. Yeah, so when these, I mean, can you imagine, Martin, when I'm dealing with, you know, pretty boring people in a bank because they are, I um, mean, let's face it. Um, I used to just wear a bright tie just to stir them, you know, because they put on their sunglasses. And um, so they would say, oh, well, yeah, it's funny, you know, because I remember when I first put this to them, I'd been to too many Anthony Robbins seminars. And of course, as you know, it's break the mold, you know, so therefore breaking the mold was, look, stop marketing on interest rates. And of course, that is just what their business is all about. Um, and I showed them the Happy Meal. I threw a Happy Meal box on the middle of the boardroom table and I said, listen, uh, this is going to be your new home loan um, uh, promotion. And they said, what? And I pulled out the Disney toy. And they said, we're going to give away Mickey Mouse figurine with it. No, no, no. It's figuratively speaking. All right. I said, who in the room has children? And they pretty much put the hand up. You know, I said, OK, who in the room's bought a Happy Meal? And they put the hand up. I said, uh, I'll give $100 right now because you're bankers. So money is the best thing for you. I'll give you $100 if you can tell me what a Happy Meal costs. Not one of them. Them. The whole 10 managers around the room could tell me what a Happy Meal cost, and yet they'd all bought a gazillion Happy Meals. So once I got them on side with being able to take your eyes off the price, then I pulled out a, you know, a couple of hundred dollar notes and I said, you're selling the same thing as Westpac Bank, as ANZ Bank, and you know all the other banks down the road. There's, you got you got exactly the same product. So you know, I think Cadbury chocolate tastes better than any other chocolate. So they've got a point of difference just in their product. But when you're handing out money, it's exactly the same as you get from any bank. So you've got to create what we call an artificial wow factor. 
because you don't have an organic wow. Cadbury have an organic wow factor. It tastes different from other chocolate. Kellogg's has an organic wow factor because their cornflakes taste different from sanitarium. But if you don't have an organic wow factor, in other words, your product is different from someone else's, like Apple, then you've got to come up with some sort of device that's going to provide a an artificial wow factor. And in their instance, they, they got it. As soon as they saw the, I said, look, I got this from ABC Bank and I got this $100 from your building. Design. Exactly the same. So you're going to have to do something to make yours more attractive. Yeah, 100%. And, and like you say, they're up against the big guys who are just doing this, have been doing this for decades already. Um, okay, so a couple of things. Which way do we want to go first? Okay, a couple of quite negative things. I'm sure you're not going to be <laughs> challenged too much by this. But this has a little bit of a poor connotation because is this one of the mechanisms that they use to pull people into timeshare type operations? Those kinds of maybe less morally good kinds of sales. Yeah, no, no, there's no timeshare. Uh, the Greater Building Society think this is it, by the way. I just looked on my desk. So this is this is what it, can you imagine? You don't see too many bank brochures that yep. uh, that look like this. Okay, so what happens is that when you actually got your home loan from the Greater you got one of these and you opened this up. It'd be all digital, of course, now, but you open it up and you could go to any one of these wonderful places around the world. If you actually, um, uh, if you borrowed half a million dollars, you could go to Fiji or you could go to Vanuatu or Bali. And if you borrowed three quarters of a million dollars, you can go to Disney World. Okay, so de depending upon how much you borrowed was where you could go on your holiday. Um, and uh, these days, the uh, company that I deal with uh, to give away the free holidays is a company out of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and what they've done is that they've given us the license to run this in the UK, uh, in America and in Australia. And uh, they contacted me after they saw the Seinfeld, you know, Greater Bank. And they, they many years later, by the way, because this that was 10 years ago, they contacted me just before the pandemic and said, listen, we're a travel company. We've got access to unsold hotel rooms. And uh, most resorts have 30% vacancy for about 40 weeks of the year. Now, during school holidays and Christmas and Easter, there's no vacancy. So nobody can you know, go then because they don't have any unsold rooms. But outside of that, we can actually get access to unsold rooms. So therefore, you have half a clue with marketing by the looks of it. We've seen what you did for the Building Society and Seinfeld and all that. Would you like to take out the license to run this in Australia? And if it works, then we'll bring you into the UK and to the States. And I said, yep, absolutely. So uh, I asked them all the questions that people would ask me. Was there any timeshare? No. Uh, well, what's in it for the hotels? The hotels, there's a lot in it for them because, you know, tonight they're running a 30% vacancy. They may as well fill those rooms with non-paying guests in the hope that those people are going to spend money at the cafe and the restaurant and room service and cocktails by the pool. They don't have to. There's no condition that they have to eat at the hotel, but they're hoping that, you know, people, if they've got a free room, they're probably going to eat at the hotel. So it's really a, it's a really, like, stunning win-win. Uh, well, win-win-win. So it's a win for the hotels because they're filling empty rooms. Uh, and hopefully those people will spend at the resort. Number two, it's a win for the business because they've got a happy meal toy from heaven. And number three, it's a win for the consumer because they've just bought a refrigerator or whatever it might be and they got themselves a free holiday. Okay. So it hadn't occurred to me that there might be some timeshare element to what you're doing. Uh, what I was saying is like it, they pull people in off the beaches in places like Spain, whatever, with a do you want another holiday? You just have to attend this seminar. It's a seminar sales thing again, I suppose. Um, yep. but I don't, I don't think that's any less valid anyway, but it kind of leads into then the second challenging thing I think about this, whereas people are, so let's take this seminar example. People are attending the seminar for the, I've just realized how stupid you're going to make me look now. Um, but they're attending the seminar for the incentive, for the incentive rather than for the product. So they're not necessarily the best motivated customers that, that you want in your business. No, we, no, we don't hold any incentive-based marketing. Um, sorry, we don't hold any holiday marketing seminars or webinars. What we do, the best way for us to sell our thing is because no one's going to sell it like I can. Uh, we've had reps on the road you know, where you know they call into businesses and say, how would you like to stimulate your trade? But because they don't come from my history, they don't come from a marketing background, if they get asked by the karate training center well how would it work for me they're lost yes uh, you know or, or if the dentist says how would it work for me whereas because i've done a to z with all of these businesses i can straight away just answer it so what we tend to do is this is this we drive people to live webinars now 
uh, and I'll just showcase the whole incentive-based marketing thing on the webinar. Very similar, Martin, to what we've done here. I'll go through McDonald's and I'll go through Kellogg's and I'll go through how Amazon have got their Prime membership and how the cafe down the road has been doing it for 20 years because if you get nine coffee stamps on your little coffee card, you get the 10th one for free. And so I'll go through all of that and then I'll say, what do you think is the number one incentive in the world at the moment, particularly after the pandemic, everyone wants to go on a holiday. Yes. Okay, no, but I was saying something a little bit different, I think. So what I'm saying is, let's get away from the seminar idea. If I am, if I am an estate agent, um, mm-hmm. and then I say, because uh, this is one of the examples that you give on your webinar, I say, mm-hmm. if you if you give us the opportunity to value your property, then we'll give you a holiday. Yep. Uh, is there a danger that people will say, okay, you can come and value the property? And we'll take the holiday, but it's already Uncle Joe. Who's only, only, if the real estate agent, only if the real estate agent is a dickhead, okay? Because the <laughs> thing is, is that they need to pre-qualify the people before they waste their time going into their house. So what they would do is that whenever we run that campaign for real estate, real estate agents have been one of our top um, industries, solar, gymnasiums, real estate agents are the top three. And with a real estate agent, if they've got a, uh, a, a, a hit rate of, let's say, two out of 10 or three out of 10, uh, valuations turn into becoming a listing sometime in the next, you know, three, four, five, six months. Then we say, okay, uh, rather than train you to get, you know, more listings because you've got two or three out of ten anyway. So just leave it at that. We'll just get you a bucket load more listings. And how you do it is that, you know, Facebook particularly, but even their letterbox drops where they put out their ugly face on a, on a brochure, it would say instead of we've got buyers in your area, so we have to check on you know, valuations, would you like to get a free valuation, which is like, duh, everyone's doing that. Your brochure would say, look, we have buyers in the area. We need to get more valuations to get a good understanding of the value of homes in the area. And we realise your time's precious. So therefore, to give up an hour for us to come into your home and give you a valuation, we're happy to give you not just a free valuation, but a free holiday now um what they would do is that when someone sees that facebook ad they click and go through to a landing page and on that landing page there's pre-qualification questions and they if they don't like the answers for example the people don't have teeth or they don't have a job or whatever it might be then they don't go and value the house right so okay. they give away holidays to people who didn't fall into the target market largely it's their own fault because they didn't pre-qualify okay good is there a danger that the incentive is so good that people will just come in to cash in on the incentive? I think that's the question I'm asking. You're right. It's about pre-qualification. But what I thought you might say is, but that's the point of the incentive is to get people in. You know, it's like mm, yeah, if the incentive yeah, is good and, enough. Martin, yeah, Martin, I don't think too many businesses would care if they people are coming in mainly for, I mean, let's face it, all those years ago when our kids were younger, my wife, seriously, when I say my wife, we both did. We couldn't go past the golden arches before we bought six Happy Meals to keep the, you know, six monkeys in the back of the Trago happy. Um, I don't think McDonald's gave a rat's ass whether or not it was the kids never even ate the hamburger. Um, they just wanted to play with the Disney toy. So McDonald's didn't care that we bought it mainly for the toy. They just sold six Happy Meals. Yes, 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 of course. And I suppose that the, the thing is the calculation. I, I responded to a, a video recently about Elon Musk and his zero dollars budget um, for marketing for any of his businesses. And what he's doing is he's just taking that money and doing wow things like putting rockets into space or, you know, these, and he's just constantly in the headlines and stuff. And I think it's interesting. I think the correlation is there are more interesting ways to spend your marketing budget, you know, there are, rather than buying advertising or consultancy or, you know, direct mail or any of these things. There are more interesting ways to spend your budget. Um, I bought this recently. It's a phone. And there was an incentive that came along with the phone, which was an air fryer. And I went and bought this on my motorbike. And I had to carry this frigging air fryer home with me. <laughs> I already own an air fryer. Um, so it was okay. I gave it to the neighbors. But sometimes the incentive isn't right, you know? Yeah. Well, you know what? That's why fuel discounts. Let me tell you how clever the fuel discount one is. Uh, we're launching this uh, probably in a fortnight. And uh, what Before we do, we that, should uh, just frame, uh, frame this for people. Let everyone know it's July 2022. Inflation has gone completely stupid. 
the price of fuel has gone completely stupid. So that's where we are. Tell us how clever it is. Good, mate. And I'll just want to know here to get a chip of A for you. What happens is that when you uh, go into your butcher shop or your delicatessen or what have you, you will, uh, for every $50 you spend, you will get 10 cents a litre. And now, you guys in the UK, do you go in litres or gallons? We go litres. Okay. So therefore, you It's £2 and a penny currently. So $4 gotcha. a litre. So therefore, this is the size of a business card. Okay. So that's the real size of it. Uh, but what happens is that for every $50 you spend at the butcher shop or the delicatessen or the cafe or wherever it might be, you get this little voucher. On the back of it, there is a, uh, a QR code uh, with, um, I mean, most people, courtesy of you know, COVID, know how to just do the QR code these days, but we put the code underneath just in case. And what happens is that uh, for every $50 you spend with that butcher, you get 10 cents a litre off your fuel. Now, the, the biggest fuel discount in Australia is at the big supermarkets, Woolies and Coles, and they give four cents a litre, and they're capped at four cents a litre. The government won't let them go any higher. So this is 10 cents a litre for every $50 you spend. So if you spend $100 at the butcher, you get 20 cents a litre. If you spend $130, $150 at the butcher, you'll get 30 cents a litre. And what happens is that it's a limit of 50 litres, and that's easy because Woolworths uh, only lose 32 litres. So the big supermarket chains, the average that people put in the car is 32 litres because everyone's got a small car these days, right? So we limit it at $50. So if you get one of these, you then go online to our rebate page and you just simply, you know, put in the code. And what we do is put the money straight into your account via PayPal. Okay, but if you think about the maths, it sounds ridiculous. Ten cents, twenty cents, you know, fifty cents a litre up to a dollar. Um, guess what? Ten cents a litre multiplied by fifty litres is five dollars. Five dollars as a percentage of the fifty you spend at the butcher shop is ten percent. So what? And if you spend a hundred dollars and you get twenty cents a litre, well, twenty cents multiplied by fifty is ten dollars. What's ten dollars as a percentage of the hundred that you spend at the butcher? Ten percent. So what we've done psychologically, we've turned a very modest and corny 10% discount into rocket fuel, excuse the pun. Uh, if you spend $500 at a butcher, okay, and you don't have to spend it all at once, okay, you want to spend them in units of 50 at the same time, but if over two or three weeks you spend $500 at the butcher, that's 10 times $50, which means 10 times 10 cents. You've just got a dollar per litre off your fuel. The biggest discount in Australia at the moment is four cents. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, but I think there's something more going on here. Which is, I mean, how much are you paying for fuel now in Australia? Where, where have you guys got uh, to? It's about $2.30, $2.40 a litre, yeah. Right. So for their 50 litres, they're going to, for their $50, they're going to get 20 litres. No, 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 no. So what happens is that basically the business is turning a 10% discount into like something remarkable. Uh, it's psychology on steroids. That's what it is. So for every yeah. $50 that you spend, you get 10 cents a litre up to 50 litres. So if you go to the gas station and you put 60 litres into your uh, you know, car, you can go to any petrol station in the world. We don't care where you go. That's the great part about this. In because the world? What happens in the world. Go anywhere you want. We don't care, okay? So therefore, what, what now, no one in Australia is going to get their petrol in America, but uh, anywhere in Australia, okay? So yeah, we're yeah. launching in the UK and America, but it'll be gallons in America, of course. So therefore, they go to any gas station. They can go to SO. They can go to bloody, you know, the, the BP, Shell. They can go to 7-Eleven and they fill up their car and they get the receipt. They take a photo of the receipt and then they go onto the uh, the website and they simply upload the receipt together with the details on here and we put the money into their account by PayPal. So the beauty of this is we haven't had to get any petrol stations involved on a brand basis. They go wherever they like and all they do is take a photo of the receipt and then they upload that onto the webpage and we put the money direct into their bank account. Good. Okay, so it's fifty liters, not fifty dollars. That's where I was getting it wrong. So, and that would ten cost cents them. That, yeah, that fifty liters would cost them twenty three dollars times five. It's going to be one hundred and twenty five dollars or something, and and they are giving them ten dollars. You see, I no, think no, 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 no. What 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 is? They can put as many liters as they like into their car, but we will rebate them ten cents a liter up to fifty of those liters. Up to fifty so liters, they yeah. Get five dollars. But keep in mind, they had to spend fifty dollars at the delicatessen or the butcher shop to get that little voucher that gives them that. Yes, 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 100%. You see, I think there's something more going on here. I think there is really good marketing going on here because I think that the key to this is having the right incentive. Mm. And there is something about the butcher knowing that you're 
your biggest concern or challenge might might be not about buying meat right now, but by buying gas or getting yourself yep. a holiday or, you know, so I think there's something about that kind of market insight to understand your customers a bit better than Coles or um, the other one. Woolworths. Woolworths. Yeah. yeah. And, but Martin, but Martin, it doesn't matter. So the thing is, because that challenge is there for all of us in business, what's the right incentive that suits my business? So, for example, if you're a hardware store with men, probably being 95% of your audience, it'd be silly to give away a flower, flowers, a bunch of flowers. It'd be just crazy, right? Yeah. Um, but we've taken that right out of the equation because there are two incentives that suit every single demographic. Men, women, 20, 120, and that is holidays and field discounts. So yeah. the reason that we spend our time coming up with, and the next one I'm coming up with will be a supermarket version of the fuel discount. So the reason we spend our time on that is because we're looking for incentives. I mean, we want to make money out of the promotions that we're putting together. So therefore, we're going to look for incentives that pretty much appeal to everyone with a with a heartbeat. Uh, the other ones that do work are um, uh, movie vouchers or dining vouchers because, again, they suit all demographics. But guess what? If you give away a movie voucher, then they know it's worth $20 or $25. The good thing about the holiday is that we sell the holidays to businesses for, let's say, $50. It's worth $1,000. So I am very good friends with the people who came up with the Happy Meal toy concept 40 years ago. Okay, yeah. now They have a factory in China. They make those little Disney figurines for around about – uh, you know, 30 cents and they give them to McDonald's for let's say 50 or 60 cents. Um, we as parents think that that figurine, because we've seen it in Toys R Us, is worth three or four dollars. So therefore that's why it works because the actual perceived value of that giveaway, that incentive is much more than what it really costs. And that's why things like the fuel discount, which psychologically it sounds like it's unbelievable. We got a dollar a litre, you've got to be joking. Um, that's why it works because the cost of the actual incentive is only a smidgen of what it's valued at. A hundred percent. And this is, so what I think is there's a double wow factor. There's the double wow. The, the first wow is how on earth are these people managing to get us this amazing deal? Like you say, they, the perceived value is much higher than, than it actually is. But the second wow is how do these people know this is exactly what I wanted? Do you know what I mean? And they know because they're local to me, because they're the small business, because they're living a very similar existence to me. I think is the perception, you know, whereas yes. like the phone yes. company, they don't know what I need. They think I need an air fryer. Everyone bought an air fryer. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, you know what the funny, I've got to tell you this, man. When I was doing the building society holiday thing, they introduced me as the wow factor guy to uh, uh, an insurance company. And the insurance company was in the boardroom of the Greater Building Society. And they, they come, you know, a few nice guys. And they knew I was sarcastic, so it was a contest, of course, you know, who could be more stupid than the other person. And uh, they said, JD, we've come up with a better incentive than you'll get a home and I get a free holiday. We've come up with our own version. It was QB insurance. And I said, okay, knock me out, you know. And they said, yeah, and this is serious. They had actually done all the artwork. They put the TV commercials together. They said they're going to give away, if you take out your home and contents insurance with them, because keep in mind, when you got a home loan from the bank, any banks, they ask you to get home and contents insurance, okay, and they get a clip. They get a clip, right? So they introduced me to QB and this guy who's the marketing guy and I could get away with giving him a bit of a bagging because he was a typical blokey bloke. He said, JD, how's this? And he shows, pulls up the poster. He said, we're giving away a free fire extinguisher to anyone who gets, you know, home and contents insurance. And I said, mate, you're an idiot. And he said, what? <laughs> Don't you think that's good? He said, it's in keeping with the brand. In other words, what you're saying before, you know, pick something that's going to, you know, suit the product. I said, mate, you're giving them something they hope they'll never use, okay? Well, it's not exactly attractive. They're not going to put it on the wall of their house and go, wow, look at that, a fire extinguisher. I mean, they know they're going to use it. You've got to give them something they're going to use. And he went, I'm a dickhead. I said, mate, gold medal, gold medal. <laughs> the thing <laughs> is, that this is the way corporations think, though, isn't it? Because actually yeah, the biggest yeah. beneficiary of a fire extinguisher is the insurance company because if they manage to put the fire out before the house burns down, they're not going to have to pay out on the house. But that's how that's how marketing people in corporations think. Do you know what I mean? It's like, so yeah. So I think there's that kind of psychology to it as well. Is these people understand what it is that we need? You know, because I think you know, you know what though, Martin. The, the thing that I get asked all the time, people you know who come on the holiday program with us, and, and basically we sell the fifty holidays. 
uh, normally for $97 each. So they pay $4,850. So that's $97 multiplied by 50. Um, but what we do, you know, from time to time is we do the right thing by them. If it's a business that can't afford that, we'll, we'll have it. Okay. Because keep in mind, we're getting the hotel rooms for free. Our COGS, our cost of goods are free. So outside of the license fee that we pay to the American travel company, I've got price elasticity. So if it's a business that I think might be coming back for more, in other words, they become a coffee drip, then I'm going to drop the price to half price of $97 because guess what? They're going to go through those quickly and then they'll keep on coming back. So that's how it works. But when some of those businesses say to us, look, we're going to run it as a contest, I said, well, I can't take your money. They go, why? We're going to say if you buy my refrigerator or buy my air conditioner, whatever it might be, then you're in the draw to win. I said, no, 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 no. Look, you won't find anyone probably globally who's done more contests than me, okay? I've done every possible McDonald's and KFC and Woolworths and Coles and 7-Eleven, everything. All scratch game. We used to do 20 years ago about $3 million a year turnover just in scratch tickets, promotions. So I said, no one's done as many promotions. I would not run another contest in my life unless it was a million dollar giveaway. Because who wants to be a millionaire and all those TV shows took the, you know, took the benchmark up. Okay. So yep. if you think someone's going to react to your giveaway because it's like a free holiday or it's a, you know, a month's worth of groceries, then you're on dope. You're smoking something really weird. Right. So what I say to them is that the, benefit that this has is that you buy you get it's not you buy you might win if you're getting the holidays for fifty dollars and they're worth a thousand dollars for god's sake give it to them right don't put them in a drawer um because if i asked you martin i mean I, i'm immune to contest because obviously i've made my career out of doing a lot of them but have you bought something recently because you could win something no no but you did buy the phone because you got the air fryer no i bought the phone because i needed a phone I hated the air fryer. I didn't want the air fryer. I was able to carry the air fryer home. That was that was the issue I had with the air fryer. It was the wrong incentive. That that's kind of the point of of that whole thing. It's um, yeah. So the 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 thing is, I don't want to get away from this. McDonald's know what little kids want. They want crappy little bits of plastic that are shaped like like Disney characters or something. You know. So I was in McDonald's yesterday. And I was looking at this, and I bought a, a Happy Meal, and I was looking at this piece of crap that they put in it, and I'm like, you could not possibly sell that to any person living on the planet unless it was going in a Happy Meal. Do you know what I mean? You you couldn't possibly yeah. do it. The key yeah. to that is that they know what piece of plastic crap it is that little kids want. Maybe better better even than parents know, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I go to McDonald's too much because we really like a McDonald's breakfast, and what was it the other day? It was like a, a speedy um, thing, a speedy thing, like one of these speedy action heroes, like super fast boy or some crap. I don't know. Who, I don't even know who it is. But you pull this thing back and I'm not I'm not joking. It would have taken a week for this thing to get to the end of the table. There was nothing speedy about this thing, you know. So, yeah. So but the, but the key then, I think, is. Like you say, you've nailed it. Everyone wants a holiday. Everyone wants cheaper fuel. Um, you've kind of nailed it with those things. But I think the key to this is really knowing what it is that is actually an incentive for people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And because uh, we want to sell this to as many businesses as possible, um, it, we had to get, you know, come up with incentives that are universally appealing uh, across all demographics. Uh, if yes. I was uh, coming up with just incentives for a hardware store, then we wouldn't put food on the table. Yeah, but there's I've still... got this guy here. I want to I want to show you if I can a second if I can bring this up. There was a uh, uh, I'll bring it up later in the interview because I'm just playing with my phone here. I'm sorry that I looked distracted, but I, I had a client who was a butcher that ran the fuel promotion years ago. So this is not the first rodeo. Okay, we've done this before. Uh, we've just improved it now. Um, and he went from uh, two million. Um, sorry, he, he went from three million to four point two million in one year just because of the fuel discount. So. Uh, he never changed anything at all. His same butcher shop. He was outside the 40-ton gorilla. So he was outside Woolworths and Coles. And, of course, you know, a bit like what you said with Tesco with your mate, they were out to wipe him out. And uh, so, therefore, he just took great delight in, um, you know, saying, well, you can get a four cents a litre at Woolworths. You get up to a dollar a litre with me. He went from three to 4.2 million. I was only trying to bring it up on my phone because I was going to show you the testimonial. Um, he, he went and bought himself a 40-foot yacht and sailed up the Whit Sundays of Australia and uh, kept on ringing me from his boat to say, thank you for buying me this boat. I said, I hate you. I just hate you. I love that. But that brings us maybe to question number two. Are we at question number two? 
I mean, you've mm-hmm. given us a sense already, but you, you can have a little bit of a boast, if you like, about some of the things that you've achieved. So the good news is, are you ready for the good news? Yep, please. I'm really feeling like you're qualified to talk to us about incentive-based marketing. <laughs> right, okay. you, you've passed question number one. So question number two, then, is who have you worked with? How have you add value to their lives? So you can just have a bit of a boast now. Look, I think really, the, um, well, first of all, if it's a, a boast session, I may as well be a complete wanker and show you that uh, when you do the seminar circuit, <coughs> you've got to write books. <coughs> and so therefore, because apparently uh, that gives you credibility. And yep. so therefore I came up with this one to start with, which was the Avalanche Leads book. And of course, I can't help but show off. So on the back of this, uh, you can see I'm there with, give me a second if I get it across. That's the going camera. the wrong way. Yeah, you can see that I'm, I'm having a coffee there with a particular comedian. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> I wrote this book. I've never read it, by the way, but uh, the funny part about it, you dictate it, give it to the Indians to put together. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's got us 280 pages. The thing that I like about these people that are authors, they write books and stuff, they look like magazines half the time. They're only that thick. You know, this is proper, like 300 pages of avalanche leads. Yeah. And we did a webinar about two months ago, <clears throat> and this guy um, says on the chat box, oh, JD, I just want to thank you because I got that book. You can get it online. And uh, we just give it away like candy is free of course because obviously you get leads and he said that book that you came up with he said a chapter five or six whatever it was just changed my entire business thank you very much and after the webinar i said to my wife i better read chapter six i don't know what it is so anyway <laughs> that, that night in bed i'm reading chapter six and uh gail my wife she goes, what are you doing i said i'm reading chapter six this is pretty good stuff <laughs> so i've never read this one but anyway um because what happens you dictate it you give it to you know the, the Indians to put together and then I had a proofreader put it all together <clears throat> and then bang I just didn't have time to read it and I thought if I'm going to be the Institute of WOW next time I do a book I should probably do a big one so this one here is the size of a tabloid newspaper and okay. uh, as you can see the WOW manifesto and what this does is that it has uh, the last 20 years of all of the ideas that have um, that have worked for me in there so therefore there's case study after case study after case study uh, this book costs four hundred and forty dollars just to print, would you believe? So I can't give that away um, as a as a real product. But what I'll do is that I'll give anyone on here the opportunity to get the digital version of that for free. Okay, so therefore I'll uh, I'll give you the link to that. Fantastic. Yeah, I will include that in the description below so people will know where to find Thanks, it. I'll, I'll send that to you. And the reason I do all of this, Martin, is because I I live to give. Uh, so uh, anyway. Um, yeah, look, uh, you know, if, if you said, look, okay, what have I provided to businesses? I mean, you know, I'm not saying we have a 100% hit rate, but it's been reasonably, you know, positive. It's probably above 80% hit rate in terms of the promotions working for businesses um, if they implement it properly. Um, and, you know, really what we deliver that an advertising agency normally doesn't is speed, okay? So, therefore, <clears throat> if we have to fix their website, it's normally done in 72 hours. And, you know, that, you know, they've probably dealt with a bearded hipster uh, with the ponytail beforehand and took six months to get together a website. Well, we do that in three days. So it's speed. It's really speed that we deliver. And also what we deliver is an ROI. I mean, this direct response stuff, if you get it wrong, then you know within three days. You know, we know that if the Facebook ad's not working, then we have to change the Facebook ad. Whereas what happens with the brand building campaign is that the advertising agency will talk you into hanging in there for another six months. Yes. The thing is, I think you're right, is that the brands, I've changed my view on brand through these conversations. I spoke to a brilliant guy called Bernard Barnaby Winter, and he's a lot like you, I think. He's much more results driven, but he's known his business is the brand bucket in the UK. And he launched brands like Boots and Mother Care and like household names now, but they weren't when he started. But he literally says, look, if I've, if I've got eight things to sell, I don't want more than eight people on my website. I want exactly yeah. those eight people who want to buy it. And he describes it as the the con of the broadcast industry that everyone needs to know about you. And it's not true at all. It's like literally the people who are going to buy from you need to know about you. So that's the whole thing. You know I think you where know you've come from another from another place is, is this wow. It's like, actually, I, I'm going to buy... Um, meat <laughs> am I going to buy yeah. it from the shop it's all the same price am I going to buy it from the shop that's helping me with what is a challenge in my life right now which is the price of fuel um, or am I going to buy it from someone who's not giving me anything or worse it. than that buy mm-hmm. it from the person who's suggesting that their meat 
is less valuable than the than the meat I'm buying by giving me a, a, a ridiculous discount. So, yeah. Martin, I, let me give, when we talk about butchers, I've got to give this classic example. Gail and I moved from Sydney to the country when the kids were young. Or we had two kids at the time. We eventually had another four. And we went to a little country, country town. Country will do that to you. Hours north. <laughs> the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies were on at the time and my mates called me the Sperminator. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But anyway, yeah, so we moved this little country town and uh, it's called Gloucester from, you know, out of where you live. And, and when we went to England, we made sure we visited Stratford and Gloucester and all that. Anyway, so it was your little main street, you know, sort of thing like you see in a country town. And there was two butchers, uh, one opposite the other. And one guy became a, a friend because I took up playing cricket with the you know, fathers uh, at the time. We all had young kids and I couldn't play cricket, but I just did it because you had a few beers of a Saturday afternoon. And this guy was part of the team. His name was Daryl. And he said to me, oh, JD, listen, you're into this marketing BS, aren't you? I, yeah, that's me, right? He said, you got any wow ideas for me for my butcher shop? I said, mate, very, very simple. Uh, he, he said, the guy across the road is beating me on price. Every time I, you know, bloody match him, he just drops his pants further. I said, well, you want to get out of that game? And he said, well, what do I do? I said, mate, just hold a sausage sizzle every day uh, from whatever it is, what, you know, 11 through to, you know, three in the afternoon. Uh, just get someone to put the white hat on and uh, be, be the chef and just have a sausage sizzle, okay? It'll cost you back or all. He went, what? I said, do it, do it, just do that. Well, anyway, cut long story short, my wife, whenever she went to pick the kids up from school, guess where she had to go? For sausage sizzle, okay? So, therefore, the kids wanted sausages from Daryl's butcher shop. Um, he had uh, one of those air conditioners that at the door, it blew down, it's pretty warm in Gloucester in summer, it blew down to make sure the air conditioning stayed inside the shop. The butcher across the road had the door closed because he wanted to keep the air, and he didn't want to pay for that extra you know, blower on the door. Guess yeah. what? The other butcher shop closed. The other butcher shop closed within six months, and I don't have absolute guarantee that that was what it, you know why. It worked. I'm pretty sure it did because he value added with just simply having a barbecue outside his butcher shop. Simple. Yeah, and everyone loves the smell of sausages. Do you know what I mean? It's like that's marketing on its on its own. You know. Yeah, I, and I think what I'm taking away from this is that you have to think about it quite differently. Because the corporations are doing it much better than you could possibly do, like the normal stuff, you know. So yep. you don't have the budget, you don't have the people, you don't have the reputation, the brand, you know. So you do have to think, I think, very differently. And yeah, I think this is genius. But Martin, don't you agree, Martin, that even that analogy, and the only reason it rolls off my tongue is because obviously I use it on every damn seminar and webinar, but. Um, if you've got an organic wow factor, and you know iPhone had that for some time before Samsung and everyone else caught up, but if you've got an organic wow factor where there's nothing like your product, um, the Rubik's Cube, for example, right? There's not another Rubik's Cube. If you've got one of those wow factors that's organic into your product, you don't need me because you know right. it's special product. Isn't it? But if you've got a Me Too product, which most of us have, and that is your solar panels are the same as every other solar panel, your pool cleaning service is the same as every other pool cleaning, and so on and so forth then you better look for an artificial wow factor. In other words, a Happy Meal toy. Because if you don't, then you're going to be resigned to price discounting. And if you think you're going to beat the 40-ton gorilla on price discounting, you're on drugs. You're on drugs, 100%. Because they will, well, famously in the UK, I don't know if you know this, that um, milk, um, they are selling milk in Tesco's, selling milk in Tesco's for less money than it costs the dairy farmers to produce the milk. And there you go. They, I mean, yeah. And they are paying the dairy farmers less than it costs to produce the milk. Do you know what I mean? So how are you yeah. ever going to compete? You're never going to compete. Okay, cool. Yeah. So that brings us to question number three, which is recommendations. What's your recommendation for someone who wants to get better at incentive-based marketing? Um, <clears throat> um, in England, go to funescapes.co.uk. <laughs> okay. And in Australia, right, right. go at funescapes.com.au. Um, yeah, look, seriously, I mean, whilst I'm flogging my own product and uh, you were kind enough to let me do that, but um, but really at the end of the day, the you know, um, I know because I've got the stats over a thousand years of doing this stuff, what works and what doesn't. And I'm not saying that I can guarantee that it will work for you, but, you know, we've got a hardware store down in Melbourne uh, in Australia and he's right across the road from Bunnings, that giant 40 ton gorilla hardware chain that I was telling you about, about the size of a football field. And what he does is he says, spend $500 with me and I'll give you a free holiday. Now, we give him the holidays for a half price, so he gets the holidays for $48.50 instead of $97. Let's say yep. he gets the holidays for 50 bucks. So if he's actually saying, I'll give you a free holiday when you spend $500 with me, spend 1000 and I'll give you two holidays, right? 
So therefore, guess what? It's a 10% discount. Now, if you spoke to him, I've got him on testimonials all over the shop because he's my best friend now because uh, he's making a lot of money out of this. Uh, he actually said, look, if I had a 10% discount, which would be $500 taking 50 off, you could hear crickets in the background. No one would come near me. This thing is a stampede because I say spend $500 with me and it's only costing me the equivalent of a 10% discount, but you walk away with the holiday. He said, I've got people coming in getting four years worth of holidays because they spent two grand. Yes. He said what it does too is that uh, it's an upsell, um, you know, David Copperfield, uh, Magic Wand, because he said if they were going to spend $400, they look around in his hardware store for something to spend another $100 on. Yes, 100%. And what's the thing I'm thinking now is I'm thinking um, – there's, so basically, they just need to have a sense of what it is that it's costing them to to find win, keep customers anyway. You know, so if they have a sense, at least that it is costing them ten percent of their turnover. I mean, the official figure—I don't know if you know this—is uh, cost of sales is uh, for the top five hundred companies is thirty percent of turnover. So if they've got a yep. sense that it is costing them money to have customers anyway, then they would have to come to you because they can't. They don't have the connections to the people with the empty rooms. With the, the why would they? They're butchers, you know. Why would they yeah. want to have all of those conversations, do all of that work when they can come to you and it's in place? And you are in business in the UK, in the states, and in Australia. So yeah, in, yeah. The, in, the, in the states because, as you know, they call um, holidays vacations. So it's called vacationsincentive.com in the states because they wouldn't know what a holiday is. Well, they do, but they their holidays are Martin Luther King's birthday. Um, but uh, in in the UK and Australia, it's just fun escapes. Yeah. Yes. Cool. No, I think. Yeah. What what choice do they have? They can go out and look for empty hotel rooms themselves, or they can go to your websites. Well, it, we've done a full circle, Martin. Because remember, at the very beginning, you were saying, "Look, what um, you know." I think the question was something like, "JD, you know, what have you found working with you know, a lot of these small businesses?" And we found that they're just so busy being a good technician. So they're a good butcher, baker, candlestick maker. They just don't have time to go out and do this stuff. Now, mind you, we're talking to set this up with all the back end whereby they go online and they book their hotel rooms and all that. I mean, we're talking a lot of money that we invested in it because it's not one of those things where you get the voucher and then you ring the Philippines and the little girl over there books you to a hotel. This is all done very similar to Expedia and the travel booking engines. And so, therefore, the back end of it is very sophisticated. Um and, you know, nobody's going to do that. Nobody could afford to do it for one business. Uh, we can do it because there are a lot of businesses on board. Yeah. And so I'll say again what I said at the beginning. We get very, I get very precious about, like, so one of the reasons I think it's challenging selling to small businesses is because they're so egotistical. And I think they need to understand the psychographics, the demographics, the value proposition, the, the search engine optimization, the, 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 you know, all of this stuff. And actually, they don't. Maybe, maybe you've cracked the code, and they just need to add in that wow that motivates people to buy from them over anyone else who's around them. You know, so yeah. But, but, uh, but Martin, the thing is, is that they still need the services that people like you uh, provide them because they still need to do their SEO and they still need to do, you know, Facebook and bloody Instagram and all of that. It's just that now they've got a tool, a promotional tool which um, can do two things that can attract a bucket load of more people and it yeah. can convert. I know I was saying before that I'm not in the conversion game, but seriously, you can imagine if you were looking for, I mean, the soul, uh, there's one video that we have on uh, Fun Escapes, the Australian one. Um, I don't think we've got it on the English one. And he's a solar dealer. Lovely guy. He's about 35, 40 years of age and uh, he's doing a few million turnover. And uh, he's in Brisbane, Australia. And he said to me, listen, this thing is just like a money tree. I said, well, tell me more. And I got my phone out, of course, to get it on video. Yeah. And uh, he said, well, my close rate, normally I'd walk into the home and the lady makes a decision mostly, of course, on this stuff. And so therefore he said, there'll be three quotes on the kitchen table. And I knew that I was going to be the fourth one. And he said, we're all within 100 or $200 of each other. And he said, my close rate was 44%. He said, it's now gone to 80 something. I forget what it was now, but 80 something percent. He said, because I say to her, if you make up your mind to go with me by five o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to give you a free family holiday. Now, by the way, in Australia, these are four day, three night holidays and likewise in New Zealand, but they can go to Fiji uh, for four nights and they can go to Bali uh, for seven nights. We're talking seven nights in Bali and the, the, the company's paying us 50 bucks. <laughs> yes, yes. See, what's the point? See, the point is the product, if the product is good enough, it closes itself. 
like people think about conversion as as being good having snaky slimy salespeople who can sell sand to arabs or um, snow to eskimos yeah that's not for me that's not a sustainable conversion the more sustainable no. conversion is the product closing itself because this is the product that someone's decided they want to buy so they don't have yeah. buyer's remorse they don't have any of that stuff and like you no. say so much of products now are, are much of a muchness they yeah. it has to be something external it has to be something external if it's going to be have a wow factor yeah yeah do you want to you want to know a statistic 97 percent of businesses worldwide have never ever used an incentive wow so well, the, now I'm the thinking you're else. kind of lazy now. What, how did you allow that to happen, John? Yeah, exactly. I should have been. <laughs> yeah, I should start later. Um, but you know, you think about it. All the incentives that you see, except for cafes, which are little coffee card, right? Yeah. Uh, so if the local cafe down the road can do it, then you can do it. Um, yeah, yeah. But you know, the incentives mainly are you know the big fast food chains, whether it be you know Kentucky Fried giving away the Looney Tune mugs or yeah. McDonald's with their toys. Uh, the, the smaller businesses have never done it. And the reason that they've never done it is exactly what we said right from the start, and that is they're very, very good technicians. Uh, when they went to uni, they learned how to be a good dentist, but they didn't learn how to actually get customers. Yes, 100%. I tried to do this once with one of my customers. It was a hairdresser's, like a hair salon, like a women's hairdresser's. And I said, look, let's do this. Let's put up little signs on the bottom of all the mirrors, like you can get them really nicely designed. And it just says our best customers never pay for a haircut because women want to have their haircut all the time. Imagine if you weren't paying for it, you could go every week. And yep. and the incentive would be you refer us 10 customers and you will never pay for a haircut. Like for every yes. 10 customers you refer, you'll never pay for a haircut. And I just couldn't right convince it. them. That, that is literally a 10% discount. Do you know what I mean? That would literally cost you 10% of a haircut to give one free haircut away. And they've got an hour or two hours or 10 hours in their schedule every week where they're standing there doing nothing. I couldn't convince them to do it, man. I couldn't convince them. I, I, I'll tell you what, I haven't heard that one before. That is a great idea. I'm not being patronizing. That is really a really clever idea. Well done. Yeah. yeah what a shame. Thanks, man. I've got to clever enough to get them to do it. My hairdressing, my hairdressing story is in Gloucester, that little town again. And because I stood out like a sore thumb because my business was in Sydney two and a half hours away, so therefore we lived in the country. But, you know, I'd drive down to Sydney maybe once a week, stay for a day or two and then come back home. And because I wasn't a local as such, I stood out like a sore thumb. And uh, Gail, my wife, used to go into Kimberly's hairdressing salon. And Kimberly said to Gail, could you ask JD if you could give me a hand on some marketing? And Gail you know, sort of cringed because you know I didn't really want to do that because you know you're never going to get paid for it. And, um, God, and Gail said, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's the old mate's rates. And uh, so uh, Gail said, what's your problem? She said, have a look across the road. There was a brand new hairdressing salon that opened across the road. And she used to be the only hairdressing salon in town. And the one opened across the road had men's haircuts for $5, okay? And yeah. uh, the idea was if the men went, it was stupid anyway because you don't make money out of men going to the hairdresser. I mean, we'll go to a butcher. We don't care and get a haircut. So yeah. it should be women. You said, but nonetheless, these people obviously were silly. Uh, men's haircuts, a sandwich board outside, men's haircuts, $5. And she said, how am I going to match that? And uh, Gail said, okay, well, I'll ask John when I get home. So she comes home and I said, okay, um, I'll, I'll go and see Kimberly tomorrow. So I went and saw her. And she'd like, by the way, this uh, other hairdresser had been open a month and stole pretty much all of her mail because uh, men don't care, do they? I mean, you know, they just go across the road for five bucks. Yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, I... We fixed it in a hurry. She got all the men back like overnight because we put a sandwich board outside her hairdresser salon and it uh, just said, we fix $5 haircuts. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, I think, I think what the marketing world needs now is a bit more creativity. You know, there's lots of people trying to flog the same, literally trying to flog the same dead horse. Okay. Um, wow. I love what you're doing, man. I hope you can bring Thank that 97% down to somewhere nearer to 96%. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, you know, one more thing I'll leave you with, um, Martin. I think we're to, you're probably wrapping up. But um, the thing that uh, amazes me is the lack of sampling as well. Um, you know, if I owned a coffee shop and given what you just told me about your advice to that hairdressing salon, I suspect yeah. you'd do the same thing. I couldn't help myself. I'd be having little shot glasses, obviously, you know, paper cups, but I'd be giving shot glasses my coffee at lunchtime um, outside the shop. I'd have some hostesses handing them out so people would have a taste of the coffee. If I was a fish and chip shop, 
I'd have calamari samples at a lunchtime being yeah. given to anyone walking because you know if they taste the calamari, they think, oh, I might go into the fish and chip. No one does that. Nobody does sampling. No. I had a similar thing with a coffee shop, and they were like um, – Brighton is where I'm from in the UK, and there was footfall going past this coffee shop. They weren't in the centre of town, but like literally where the students were living, where – like young families were living this was like the rat run into the center of brighton so literally if you stood there between seven o'clock and eight o'clock there must be a thousand people walk past this shop and the thing about coffee specifically is they sell it for two and a half quid it doesn't cost them 25 pence to make it do you know what i mean so it's like i would just be there at seven o'clock every day just giving away actual full-blown coffees every single day get them depending on that coffee to get them to work do you know what i mean and and that's this comes back to the point I've been trying to make that you haven't really engaged with. You don't have to. It's OK. People don't really understand that finding winning, keeping customers will cost you time and energy and money, you know, and it really yeah. is just about understanding that and then thinking about, OK, if it is going to cost me time and energy and money, what time and energy and money is it that I want to put into having these customers and how do I want to do it? And this is what Elon Musk has done. He said, "Okay, if I'm going to have to spend billions on um, on marketing, I might as well put rockets in the in the sky and and tell people I'm going to Mars." Do you know what I mean? Because it has the same effect. So I think yeah. that's kind of yeah. what you're doing. I think it's kind of what Elon Musk is doing. So there you go, John. You and Elon I'm Musk are in the same Elon category Musk. in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Yes. So you've given us a couple of recommendations already. Question number four is what should people read? Um, I will link to your books if you send me the links in the description below. Is there something that you've read that has had a significant impact on the way you think about doing business? Um, well, uh, I'll give you the book in just a second, but the sort of people who I've followed, whether it be audio books, and it's mostly audio books in the car these days, because I'm sure I speak for any entrepreneur and you're one, uh, you don't have a lot of time to sit around the fireplace and read a book. Uh, so it's much easier listening to them in the car. Um, but, you know, the, the sort of guys that I've followed over the years, aside from Richard Branson, which is a must have, of course, is your Walt Disney's and your Steven Spielberg's and people like that. And the reason is, is because they are like wild creative uh, and so is Richard Branson and you know when um, you know my six kids uh, they don't ask for my advice until they get married and have a mortgage up until then I don't think they know what to do for a living okay and but when they have a mortgage or they have a little baby um, then they need more money so they say oh dad that marketing stuff that you've been doing for a hundred years could you help me with my, <laughs> what I'm doing right yeah and uh, I normally say to them listen you know without being too ridiculous about it i say look hang around with people who say why not not people who say why and yes. you know if you look at richard branson or you look at you know i mean richard branson's is just do it you know but you know you look at walt disney or steven spielberg or any other elon musk they're the sort of people i know that they're up there you know we're just normal regular people and they're different from us but i'm sure they live with the principle and that is oh why not you know why not put a rocket ship you know to the moon uh and really um i have to say that my little group we're only small business there's half a dozen of us um, but I'm proud that every one of those, when I say to them, look, can you do this? And I've got a few, you know, online geeks. Um, and I'll say to them, can you do this? Because I don't know whether it can be done or not. And they go, yeah, why not? We'll give it a shot. And yeah. they're, that, they're the books, I guess, I would read. People who say, why not, not why. Because if you hang around an accountant, and no, I've just probably lost every accountant who's watching this, but normally they'll go, oh, but why? But why? You know, I yeah. love hanging around people who go, why? We made a TV show many years ago. I... Uh, had a kick in the guts, uh, oh, you know, that's 15 years ago, and lost a couple of million dollars in one week through a printing mistake. We were printing the Aladdin bubblegum cards here in Australia, and I went overseas, and the general manager that was printing them made a big mistake, and the numbers were all upside down and wrong. Anyway, a long story short, we lost our house, we lost everything, it was $2 million down the drain. And I ended up getting the license to have the uh, rugby league football cards. And in Australia, just like soccer is big time in the UK, Australia, rugby league is the big sport. So I made all that $2 million back and paid everyone back in the next year, which is great. And I promised the guy upstairs that if I did get back on my feet, then I'd do something to pay back. So we created a show called Dreams Can Come True. And it was all about making dreams come true. It was a TV show, a national on Channel 10. And uh, there's a pop star here in Australia. Well, he's my vintage now, but he was a pop star back in his day called Daryl Braithwaite. It was, a, it was a, a group called Sherbet, and they were like the Beatles of Australia, right? And I got him to be the host for this TV show, 
and we delivered dreams to people who were doing it tough. So if they didn't have a house, we just rolled up and gave them a house. Uh, if they didn't have a car, we rolled up and gave them a car. If they hadn't seen their auntie for 24 years because she lived in England, we brought them out from England. If they wanted to meet Michael Jordan, we flew them over to Chicago to meet Michael Jordan. So we had Spielberg, Michael Jordan, we had Cliff Richard, we had uh, Meatloaf, all the big stars in the world contributed to this TV show. And it was a ratings hit. It was fantastic. And guess what? The only reason it got put together was because five people, it was only five of us put it together. We had no clue what we're doing, by the way. We'd never produced a TV show before. Um, but we just winged it. And the TV station gave us 142 grand for every show. And we got the biggest stars in the world on this. And the reason that we did is because we said, oh, why not? Let's give it a shot. And they're the people I want to hang around with, people who just go, oh, why not? Yes. The book, by the way. Uh, no, you probably had this from other entrepreneurial people, and that is the uh, the uh, purple cow. Purple okay, cow, Seth book? Godin. Yeah, Seth Godin. So the reason that that obviously would be the book that I would support is because it's all about standing out, the purple cow in the you know in the in the uh, in the farm. Hundred percent. That's a great book. Really good book. Yeah, man, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I don't know how you're feeling about it. Yeah, oh, I loved it, mate. Yeah, very. And it was nice and easy, sort of uh, coffee table chat. Super cool. Good. So the I good like... thing is, is it's pretty obvious to me that both of us know everything. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, we know absolutely everything. It's certainly between us. I know 98% of stuff. You know, <laughs> uh, you know 98% of stuff. The other, uh, and we cross let over let, to 2%. Let me just leave my wife's anywhere because if she was anywhere near me, she'd be rolling her eyes right now. <laughs> good. Okay, so if you've enjoyed this conversation, then you shouldn't have any trouble throwing a couple of people under the bus who might endure to have a conversation with this like me. Um, and they need to be people that you can kind of introduce me to. That's the idea. So who do you think would benefit from this conversation and might benefit my small but growing audience? I'll give you one which will be an absolute hit, uh, okay? And I know he'll say yes. Uh, and then I'll think through after we finish this, I'll think through of some others and just email them to you. But the one that uh, you will just get blown away with is a guy who used to be a senior executive in the Disney Corporation in America at Walt Disney World, okay? Yeah. And he's become a good friend of mine over the years. Um, and, yeah, uh, his name is John Formica, okay, F-O-R-M-I-C-A, John Formica. And uh, he runs around the world these days uh, teaching people how to run their business like Disney. And uh, he is just such a nice bloke. Um, he's not as sarcastic as you and I, so therefore he's just more normal. Um, but he's just a <laughs> lovely, lovely guy. So... I can easily um, sort of uh, introduce you to him via uh, email and I'm sure he'll say, yes, he's a lovely guy. He'll, he'll show you how Disney runs their business and how other people can run their business like Disney. Wow. Well, that would be amazing. That would mm. be amazing. That sounds absolutely amazing. If you can make that happen, then maybe you could just refer one. I'd, I'd be happy enough with that. I think he'd be worth he, – that one would be worth three or four because uh, – the secrets that he gives in terms of you know what Disney does to attract and retain uh, people is just it's just amazing. Uh, I mean, when you get behind the door, I I did a lot of courses over in Orlando. Uh, Disney run uh, educational courses out of the Orlando park, and I, I did a couple called uh, Dreaming and Doing. So they show you how they dream up the idea and then they how, how they execute it. I didn't meet him at these. I only met him probably five years ago, and I was so impressed that I brought him out to Australia and we did a tour, a seminar tour together. Caught wow. if Disney ran the business, what would it look like? And he's just a delightful guy. And <laughs> he said he likes a scotch, by the way. But um, he, he complimented me. I think it was a compliment. He said I was the weirdest marketing guy he'd ever come across. So I think that's a compliment. Yeah. I think that's a compliment. I think you'd have to take it as a compliment. You couldn't take it literally, could I you? So. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Man, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. So what we'll do now is we'll say goodbye for anyone who's still with us. And then what will happen is I'll stop the recording and we'll say goodbye like normal human beings. But, man, I have thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for your time, man. It's been absolutely brilliant for me. My pleasure. Thanks, mate. 